Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Living the New Science, my podcast where you discover all the latest things that are happening in the new science and how that changes everything about how we live our lives. So I want to also talk about tools for a new world. And one of the tools I want to talk about today actually is very close to hand. His name is Brian Hubbard. He is one of the top innovative British editors. He's been an editor of a publication for such notable places as the Financial Times, EMAP. He is the founder and co-editor of What Doctors Don't Tell You, and he's also the originator of an amazing new theory called Time Light. And he's gonna tell us all about it. And there's a PS to all of this. I'm married to the guy and I have been for about 34 years. So welcome, Brian. Thank you, wife. Thank you very very much for the invite. Lovely to be here. But then I always am. (laughs) So we want to talk to you about Brian's new theory, and it's a radical new way of looking at your life, looking at your past and healing. So Brian, First of all, tell us, in a nutshell, what time life is. Okay, well, it's a recognition that time is the single biggest driver of the human experience, essentially. And um, time is not, as we've been told, that it's a dimension, but rather that it's an energy. And time is an energy that gets released at the moment of trauma, upset, Or essentially that moment when you are suddenly divided from the world and you see the world and your parents as separate from you. So it's the rise of the individual, if you like, that is the birth of time. And as I say, when you recognise and understand that, that time is actually the result of trauma, that then gets interpreted by the energy of time in so many different ways in our lives. So, for example, you know, personality ticks and kinks, if you like, all the way through to serious mental health conditions are, I believe, all in the foundation of time. Now, when you talk about trauma, it's not just about being part of a blown up building. You're talking about a whole spectrum of traumas. Do you want to go into that a little bit more? Trauma is a clinical term. And actually it's a term I don't use once we get into the time light uh, philosophy because I think trauma means so many things to different people. And most people would say they weren't traumatized. And, um, but probably they were. And, but because it's a term that as you say is usually reserved for war zones and what you will. You know, it's a term I try to avoid if I can. But essentially, trauma is not what happens to you, but it's your inability to respond to it. And that's the, the fundamental point about trauma. It's our inability to respond to things. I mean, it's a taking away of your power. Yeah. It's a taking away of your yeah. powers. So your teacher shouts at you yeah. or tells you you're stupid at math and you're only seven years old. So you don't feel that you're able to really respond in a way that your grown up self might. Yeah. And that is the thing that lingers on. Yeah. But but just to, 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 to finish that point, I mean, we think of trauma as a, a childhood experience. But fully 40% of all trauma happens when you're an adult. Mm. And that can happen with you know, anything, really, from divorce to you know, your partner having an affair to a child dying or whatever can also be traumatic. And for, as I say, 40% are actually occurring in adulthood. So one way of categorizing them are the 18 adverse childhood events. Do you want to talk to you yeah, I mean, to that a bit? Yeah, again, we're, well, we're mixing up our definitions here a bit. But mm-hmm. um, in 1997, the researchers from Kaiser Permanent uh, put together a study, I think it involved over a thousand people. 
and they classified 18 different things that could happen to you as a kid and they call them adverse childhood uh, events or aces and you know they range from relatively benign things happening um such as you came home but your parents were there uh all the way through to incest rape uh parents divorcing parents taking drugs etc etc but the interesting thing about this and this was one of the really first endorsements of the time light uh, philosophy, whatever you want to call it. I actually call it a spiritual therapy, but anyway. But this was a really early endorsement that I'm onto something. There is something in my own discoveries about time light that seemed to, uh, as I say, underpin it. And it was this. As I say, the kinds of pertinent people were looking at, at childhood events 18 of them were, were defined by the researchers. There, of course, are many more. Um, but anyway, they found that those who had experienced six of them uh, were something like more likely to die prematurely by up to 20 years prematurely compared to others who experienced, I think, three or, or fewer. And, and this went through a whole range of chronic health problems as well. So we were also seeing... Things like arthritis, diabetes, heart disease, cancers. They were all um, so had a raised risk if people had three to four or more ACEs. And I think this is incredibly important because, um, and indeed it's been recognised, it's now recognised as I think the fourth major cause of, of death in the West, but it's one that is still not really acknowledged, but nonetheless it's there. But really, so why did this underpin and endorse Time Light? Well, because no one was actually taking the step beyond that. They were just recognising the pattern that ACEs were a contributing factor and maybe the main driver of premature death, of cancers, etc. But no one was actually asking the question, OK, so why? Well, why should it be that you know, something happening to you as a kid affects you as an adult. And, and they didn't answer and haven't answered that question. Uh, but they talk about the biological processes that happen when uh, you, you, after trauma or an ACE, whatever you want to, how you, however you want to express it. And they talk about things like the amygdala uh, section of the brain resizing, they talk about biochemical processes that go through the body, and these are typical of a traumatised person. But again, you have to say, OK, well, that's great. As if that then is the definition of what's going on. But it's not, because if something is changing the shape of your brain, there has to be an energy behind that. There has to be an energy that drives chronic disease. There has to be an energy that drives premature death. There has to be an energy that drives the shape of your brain or changes the shape of your brain and drives biochemical processes. And that energy I put forward is what I call time. It is the energy of the trauma itself. And then it sort of makes sense. But it also fundamentally changes what therapy is because if what i'm saying is true and i suggest to test it in your own lives don't just go on what i'm saying but if what i'm saying is true you fundamentally change therapy because you are no longer trying to treat a problem anxiety depression etc you instead are changing your relationship to the energy of that event or your relationship to time and that is fundamentally different and that really to me is a radical departure from current therapy oh absolutely well let's just dive into that for a bit i mean the other hat we wear is we're both editors of what doctors don't tell you which we have been running just about as long as we've been married and in that we've been seeing that psychiatry isn't working very well. Do you want no. to just talk to that a bit? Yeah, Brian? sure, by all means. I mean, look, I don't want to down speak about any therapy if, if you're getting help from anything more well, great, good for you. But fundamentally, uh, psychiatry has had a pretty ragged history. And 
it really only came into its own uh, after the American Civil War in the 1860s because men were coming home and they were shell-shocked. It what is what we call now PTSD, but they didn't have that term then. But they were seeing people who were traumatised and affected by the war. And that essentially was the birth of, I suppose, modern psychiatry. Um, prior to that, uh, psychiatric conditions were entirely the result of alcoholism or excessive masturbation. <laughs> Um, so it took that civil war to say, no, there is something more profound than that going on. But until um, really the birth of the pharmaceutical industry, you know, the psychiatric, psychiatric profession didn't have many places to go. Um, and really they were only starting to embrace Freud, Freudian uh, psychology in the 1960s. I mean, he'd said most of his stuff in 1890. But the problem with that was, of course, much of the American health system is driven by uh, insurance, which therefore is driven by results. And Freudian uh, psychiatry or psychology doesn't give you an end date. <laughs> it doesn't say you'll be OK in two weeks' time. This is no good for the insurance industry, at which point the pharmaceutical industry is perked up and said, well, we can come up with psychiatric drugs for you. But what they did, and this is really where it started to go badly wrong, because at that point, when they got involved, we saw the birth of different definitions of psychiatric disorders. And we, the earlier Bibles of the psychiatric industry were reporting something like, in the 50s, were reporting something like 100 mental conditions which to me still sounds like an awful lot. But they said it was about 100. But it was, it was anything from being frightened of birds to you know, being, being traumatised by litter. You know, it's all sorts of extraordinary things. But the point is by 20... Uh, I think the last edition came out about 2012, they had listed 360 <laughs> mental health problems. And why? Because you have so many different drugs for different health conditions. You split the problem up. So you are depressed, you're anxious, you're psychotic, you are bipolar, etc., etc. As, as different materializations of mental problems. But if it's true that um, mental conditions are actually an energetic imprint from the past, it's also possible that we are talking about a spectrum of disorders rather than disparate, separate disorders. So, in other words, there is only mental illness, or whatever you want to call the term, which is a matter of degree, but not type. But that, I think, is also something that needs to be explored, because I think... You know, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry has now given up on psychiatry and both were very happy for the divorce because psychiatry was also not being helped by the drugs. They, they were not getting great results from them. And so they both agreed to part, having pocketed a lot of money. And the psychiatric profession is now back to doing electrical uh, convulsive therapy, the electric shock treatment and so forth. And really, that's now got become the go-to therapy of modern psychiatry. So that's the state of psychiatry today. Well, exactly. And we write about every month about the drugs not working mm -hmm. and depression, mm -hmm. particularly, it just not working. No. You know, either it is stupefying mm. or, and as you said, if you've been helped by a psychiatric drug, you know, good for you and we do find that belief and interest in your uh, therapist and connection with your doctor and all of those things are really key. So if you're con connected with your doctor and believe in his therapies, that is more than half the battle and that's certainly my work and intention. But what we've found, which is so interesting, and Brian and I work together in retreats well, we've just come out of a weekend workshop in Germany. We're doing a week-long retreat in Yorkshire in a place called Broughton Hall, 
next September. And what we do is combine our work on time. So Brian's whole foundation is the fundamental of what we're doing, that time is an energy. But also, if time is an energy, and we know in physics it's one big smeared out now, then a lot of my work is about essentially retro intention, that taking back your power can happen at any point because you're talking about one big smeared out present where that so-called trauma still exists in your body. And it's about, as we talked about, it's about re retrieving your power, taking back your power in that situation, even if it happened 40 years ago, 50 years ago. So that's a lot of our work. And Brian also dives into something that's so interesting, call, you call the t troublesome 20. <laughs> so this is time light, time heaviness, as you call it, made manifest. You want to talk about that a bit? Sure. So, I mean, the f um, we all have, uh, you know, mental tics, behavior issues and such like. <clears throat> You know, and what we do with, with them well, is one of several things we do. We, we pretend we don't have them. Uh, we try to hide them by drinking, gambling, or whatever we will. <clears throat> or we try to get therapy for them, especially if you have things like an anger problem or what have you. So anyway, so I listed 20 of them. And, you know, the list could have gone on. But let's stop at 20, you know, there is a, there, you know, we've got to worry about ink and paper in the world. So I stopped at 20. But they, they range from anything from, um, you know, always being late or from, you know, distrusting the world or always expecting the worst or whatever it might be. And it gives a range of things like that. But again, actually, each of the problems that we have is an invitation to actually transform your life. So you don't run away from them, you don't drown them in alcohol, but you actually explore them. And that's the starting point of the Troublesome 20, is that you, this is your way in, it's what William Blake said was his golden thread that takes you to the very walls of Jerusalem. I can't promise you'll get to Jerusalem, but um, it is a golden thread. And it's something we're given. So rather than avoiding it or whatever, it, I invite people to explore them, to explore this issue and really try to understand, well, fundamentally, why do you have them? You know, why should you distrust the world? Why should you have you know, money problems or whatever it is? Um, you know, why should you have these? And... Um, Again, people don't think about that any more than, you know, these psychiatrists have thought about why ACEs cause chronic health problems, you know. But when you do look at that, you have to say, well, you know, there's there's a pattern from somewhere. You could say, oh, you know, I, I, I was born like that. Well, explore beyond that because there is, there's something that went on before you were born. Or, my parents were like that, yeah? So you then you say, okay, but uh, what people call genetic patterning, I call memory. It's memory, it's not, it's, it's not there's not, not genetics. But the third and the most likely reason is, of course, because you have experienced this in your life. And that is why you now distrust people or whatever it might be. So having got this lovely uh, present, this lovely invitation from the world to explore, that is your starting point. You start from that point of where you are and you start digging deeper to understand, okay, why? And then you ask again beyond that point, okay, so why? You ask again, so why? And you start uncovering layer after layer on the obviously there to help unfold all these things, but you'll go deeper and deeper from, yes, it must be the past, to understanding that the past 
must be an energy from understanding that your relationship with time therefore must change but to get to the fundamental kernel of their saying so therefore what am i Mm-hmm. Because you see, the the the, the deepest uh, level of this is that we walk around believing that we are a actualized agent, independently able to make decisions and choices, to whom things happen. So you know, the current model has it that I, independent agent Brian has an anger problem, right? Which is somehow separate from me, which also would suggest, if you give a moment's thought, would suggest that you've actually chosen it in that case. Because if you are an independent agent who chooses, well, you have chosen to have anger problems. And you say, well, that's crazy. Of course I haven't. No, you haven't. That's right. But in realizing that, you fundamentally changed who you think you are. Mm -hmm. Let's take a concrete example. So everybody remembers a couple of years ago, the Academy Awards. Uh And we were all shocked when Will Smith went up and slapped uh, Chris Rock. Chris Rock. Yeah. So that wasn't, he was reacting not to that moment he was reacting to something that happened in, in his past. So you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, again, it, 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 he, he sort of, in interviews afterwards, um, you know, Will Smith said, well, I don't really know why I did that. You know, I just had to. I was impelled to do it. And I was impelled because it really brought back all the experiences and memories I had as a child when my father uh, was bullying and I I believe was violently assaulting Will Will Smith's mother. His mother. Um, When, as a five-year-old, he had to observe this and could do nothing about it. He was, you know, hopeless in that situation against a, a grown man. But here he was, now a grown man himself, seeing his wife being attacked verbally by Chris Rock. He was making fun of her because she has alopecia. Yeah. So she, she, you know, had her head shaved. Yeah. So he was, he was making a joke and yeah. it enraged yeah. Will Smith. It did indeed. And he went up on stage and slapped him. Um, but what was going on? Was Will Smith an independent agent Or was he driven by the energies of the past? Well, I pretty much know the answer, and I think everyone else does as well. And and Will Smith himself essentially admitted it. I Mm. didn't know what I was doing, but uh, I was impelled to do so. Absolutely. And that's how, and a perfect illustration of this idea that you are the past. You are an agglutination of these misunderstood not fully understood situations that continue to live through you and that is really part of your that's central to your work is part of what we do together when we do these workshops is essentially going back to some of those important initial moments where you were first aware for instance of exhibiting or the cause of those Troublesome 20, for instance. You know, if you have anger problems, if you always have money problems, if you're always late, where did that come from? And we oftentimes find going back to one of those essential seed moments and just playing that out in your head. And this is one of the exercises we do together. You play it out in your head, but you don't change, you don't change fundamentally what happened. So say you've got, you're there, your teacher is humiliating you. Um, he, she's put your name at the very bottom of a list of, of outcomes from a test. So you're the bottom, the dunce. And at the time you were hanging your head in shame and you couldn't say anything. You were seven years old. But we take you back to then answering, saying what you wish you could have said 
if you were older and more mature. No, miss, I'm not stupid in math, but I'll understand it later. I don't understand what you're teaching now, but I will do in a few years. And that kind of thing seems to change the energy. Now, you have loads of other things that you do too, Brian, in terms of, <clears throat> of helping people move forward into what you call no time. Tell everybody a little bit about this whole idea of no time and three selves. Oh, okay. <clears throat> well, if you sort of um, extend the time model a bit further, uh, then you would say, well, we are present time, so we're all here now. <clears throat> and present time encompasses the entire universe of the, of the known universe, if you like, um, and is the home of sciences as well, and all the other things, and of immediate experience. And included in that would be the need for you know, shelter and food and sex and so forth and so on. And these are the fundamental drivers of present time. Uh, then you go, so things happen to you, and we start building up memories. Now, there are three types of memory according to the timeline model. We've spoken mostly about psychological past, the traumas, the aces, the things that upset you that essentially divide you from the world and their psychological past. But there are two other memories and the, one is called the narrative memory. So I know my own story, which is that my name, where I was born, the religion I was brought up in, if any, um, all these things where I live, if you like. And then the final one is called knowledge memory. So I remember how to do things, where it, whether it's to tie a shoelace or, or where a part my car or whatever it might be. And, and it, all of these are actually memories. And, and the fact that I know how to tie my shoelaces is, is because I remember how to do it. It may be an instinctive memory, but nonetheless, it is a memory. And it is just interesting to say as an aside that um, it's in fact the fusion of two memories which are the home of conflict and war, which is the narrative of the psychological memories. <clears throat> so it's the fusion of my story, my people's story, my nation's story, coupled with psychological hurts, which actually form the basis of all conflict that's ever happened on this planet. And it's an extraordinary thought that actually we go to war and we fight because of memory. But that is true. It's exactly what we do. Um, and uh, I guess we always will until we wake up to what is going on, you know. And I think that the, the sadness, I mean, we both travel around the world and we see the most remarkable human beings, the most wonderful people, you know, and it's a very real moment, isn't it, when we meet people and we're in contact with them and you just look into their eyes. You know, it's a pure moment. There's no, you know, there's no memory. There's no history with that. Mm. And you sort of think, see these wonderful people. You think, well, how could there ever be war? Yeah. And the reason why is because, you know, they fall back on their memories. And that's why there's war. But in that moment of pure human existence, there is no possibility of war. You know, but that's the truth. Yeah. And the final part of ourselves, the third part uh, is no time. And that's our saving grace. Now, note I call it the potential centre, because that is where all potential happens. It's also no time, because it's eternal, and, and uh, that's what we are. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, we all have to go through this, you know. It, it, is the, it is the lot of the human condition to go through all the things I've just been talking about. You know, no one gets a free pass here. No. And so, and so, um, but we have to go through that and understand that for no time to come into our lives, into the world. Now, that's something that you understand personally because you mm. went through it. Mm. I mean, part of this was really your own journey, too, mm. in understanding a very difficult past in childhood. Um, you know, I witnessed so much of this mm. in our first years of marriage too. Uh, you had a pretty abusive father, a lovely mother, but a, a father who was essentially five years old. Mm. Well, that's right. I mean, that's where the whole 
time like thing came from because ultimately I'd had enough, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was Peter Finch. I'm angry as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and um, that was a reference to which movie was that? Um, Network. Network is a reference yeah. to Network. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, so I uh, was abused as a child for about six or seven years. And my mother was really didn't have the equipment to, to, to deal with this with my father. You should say emotional abuse. Emotional abuse, yes yeah, it was. he wasn't physical. He but... wasn't physical. But nonetheless, it wasn't a great, you know, start. And... Well, he didn't call, call you by name for the first seven he years. He did not. He whistled for me um, for about seven years. And to this day, I salivate when anybody whistles. And I, <laughs> and I ask for a biscuit. No, I don't. But as a result of that, you know, I grew up as an adult really with no confidence at all, which is not really surprising if you've not been, you know, recognised as a human being. Um, and then from that, I, I plunged into chronic depression. And it was really that drive to understand what had happened to me. And I had not made the connection between my depression and childhood abuse. It had not occurred to me, you know, duh. But then, of course, it's obvious after the fact, but actually most people do not realise that connection. You know, depression is something that's happened to them, but they don't really know why. It just, it's one of those things that happens. But actually, when you suddenly realise that direct route to, to you know, your, your, your childhood and, and the abuse you suffered, you know, is, is, is a revelation. And then... I suppose there were, there were a few clues along the way. One was my own father's death, who, um, when I went to see him, he was in bed, and he just said he'd had enough, you know? He was about 90 then. He was right? 90, and he said I'd had the... But, you know, he'd also been you know, examined a few years prior when they said he had the heart of something like a 70-year-old, you know, something 20 years younger. But nonetheless, there he was in bed and saying he'd had enough, and three days later, he indeed died. And, you know, not such an uncommon experience, I think, that a lot of old people really feel they've had enough. But you have to, have to wonder, well, had enough of what exactly, you know? But that was a clue. And then another clue came along years later, which was this book about ghosts mm. by a professor called Ian Stevenson in Canada. And he pretty much sort of, you know, gambled his entire academic career on discovering what ghosts were. You know, this is not a favoured subject by his institution, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, he felt determined to find out. And the, the stories were quite remarkable. And, um, it, you know, whether you believe in ghosts or not, the, it's a strong metaphor. And it's a strong metaphor for a past that continues, that there is an energy around things that have happened. And that was it. And then I put the book down and this enormous revelation came to me. And it was this extraordinary expression which crashed into my head you know that to which you do not fully attend shall weigh you down i didn't know where it came from i don't to this day and i'm still figuring figuring it out i'm still you know it is still the the, the essence of time life because mm -hmm. it has to be because it was a it was something given somehow i don't know what it was and you know you explore those two elements that to which you do not fully attend well, what does that mean it means I was not fully there. I was not fully present uh, at the moment when I suffered the trauma or the experience. Therefore, it has left an imprint on me. And I do invite people to live a life of 360 degrees. Most people live a life of about 90 degrees, you know, but and it gets better at 180, but I invite people to look at 360 degree living. That to which you do not fully attend. Shall weigh you down, which is the past then accumulating and forming so many selves of yourself if you like none of which are actually you and because the only essential self that is you is that which is eternal which is timeless but we have this aggregation of time from experience which clouds that mm. and um so that's how it is that is the human condition in mm. three sentences without a tea break. Yeah. <laughs> but the great news is we've been seeing in the work that we've been doing 
remarkable transformations. I'm going to think about one person who came to our event uh, last September, our retreat, who had always been bullied by his stepfather, who essentially didn't want him and kept telling him how stupid he was and how he didn't get things, etc. And in our retreat, we talked with him, and I remember you talking with him, and particularly helping him to see this in the round, to talk to his stepfather again, and also to forgive him. That's another big piece of the work that we do, the work that you do, is on helping people to forgive. So we change the energy, but then we also help them to see things really in 360 degrees, which is what that person, the perpetrator, let's call them, um, what the situation was for them. And in your father's instance, he was a very unrealized person, an unexamined person. His life was not ex examined in any way to see how he was the architect of so much misfortune in his life and he decided to take it out on his three sons, you in particular. So what we've seen is more work that we can do energetically that really transforms this human tragedy into a way of going forward, into a, a, you know, into a revelation for the people and also a healing. So we've seen that, we saw a woman uh, reverse her stage four cancer uh, through the week of our, our workshop. We've seen other people forgive, even abusive husbands. We had somebody in our group last year who had a totally abusive husband, dragged her down the stairs, you know, hit her, all kinds of things. She escaped from him with their child and divorced him, thought she dealt with the whole thing turned out in the workshop she recognized she hadn't and she completed it by forgiving and recognizing as well that perhaps she had been she had taken part in this whole difficulty by not having the strength to leave before so so much of this work is really about healing that powerlessness and understanding things from the other person's point of view too, no matter how vile they may have been. So Brian, you've got a couple of things. We have a couple of things coming up. First of all, you should know he is the author of a book called The Untrue Story of You, which is really the fundamentals of Time Life, published by Hay House in America and the U UK. Mm -hmm. And I think a few other countries like uh, Sweden and the Netherlands. Uh, you have a live event coming up, a live free event coming up. I do. And what's going to happen in that? Yeah, it's a totally money free event, free of charge, where I'm going to sort of spend uh, some time uh, talking about time light, but also it's interactive. So it's going to be a live webinar. So if you come on the live webinar, it's, obviously it's going to be recorded as well. If you come on live. Um, if we can get round to people and try to answer some of their individual issues uh, there and then, uh, I'll endeavour to do that. And um, you have to go to my website, though, to sign up. And your website is? Timelight.co.uk. But there's a little hyphen between time and light. Time-light. .co.uk. So time-light.co.uk. That's it. And it is on the 20th of April. Yep. Um, and it's 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern, 5 p.m. UK, 6 p.m. Europe. And we have something else. So people sign up. If you can sign up on the website, you can come to his free event. You can ask Brian any kind of question about Time Light, and he'll give you more detail about how this all works and how it's healing so many people around the world. We're seeing it ourselves. Now, if any of you want to actually participate in something with us in person, we're both running our Heal Your Past 
retreat at the beautiful historic 16th century stately home Broughton Hall in Skipton, Yorkshire. We're running it from the 1st to the 8th of September um, this year. So it's your chance to stay in the runner-up location of Downton Abbey. There are also historic cottages that we'll be taking out as well, and you'll be with us in this beautiful spiritual place, which is also the home of all of the Princeton University pair equipment is now housed at Broughton and is working. So you get a chance to play with those REG machines yourself. And there are so many other aspects to this place that made us decide that this is the perfect place for our retreat. It's got a labyrinth, it's got an amazing fire pit. We have a stately home dinner with a string quartet. We have a cosmic garden experience. There's wild swimming and so much more. 3,000 acres is just beautiful. So if you want to find out more about that, you can find it on my website, lynnmctaggart.com. So, Brian, thank you for being a guest here wow. on my podcast. Well, there's a long way to come. <laughs> we talk about this. Do you pay double. travel expenses? <laughs> from the next room. So, from the next room and from both <laughs> of us, uh, thank you for listening to Living the New Science and Tools for a New World. I hope you'll take some of this out into your life and work toward becoming, as Brian puts it, Time light. Thanks for listening.